Good evening. My name is Mark Syme. I'm the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ. I would like to extend this opportunity to welcome you to our PM services for Sunday, September the 8th. We will sing several songs. We will observe the Lord's Supper. And I have a message that I hope will be beneficial to all of us. Here at Northfield, we sing from the songbook, Songs of Faith and Praise. I don't know if you have that book, but I will give you the number and the name. And perhaps if you have a different book or you are quick enough to Google the song, uh, you can sing along with us. The first song that we will sing this evening is number 38, Awesome God. Awesome God. <clears throat> Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns. From heaven above with wisdom, power, and love, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Number 71. Number 71, as the deer, as the deer, number 71, as the deer. <clears throat> As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield, to you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. To prepare for the Lord's Supper, let's turn to number 383. 383, Jesus, keep me near the cross. 383, Jesus, keep me near the cross. <coughs> Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain. Free to all a healing stream Flows from Calvary's mountain In the cross, in the cross Be my glory ever 
Till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross a trembling soul, love and mercy found me. There the bright and morning star sheds its beams around me. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever. Till my raptures all shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross, O Lamb of God, bring its scenes before me. Help me walk. From day to day, with its shadow o'er me, in the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall fall. Beyond the river. One of the things we're instructed to do on the first day of the week is observe the Supper of the Lord. It is called the Lord's Supper. It is called Communion. It is called the Eucharist. Uh, whatever name we choose, uh, it is what we are taught to observe. We know from the 20th chapter of Acts in the 7th verse, that while Paul was preaching at Troas, he said, let us gather together on the first day of the week to break bread. Uh, this was instituted by Jesus Christ on the night and he was, that he was betrayed. And the reason we are to observe this every Lord's Day is because Jesus wanted to make sure, absolutely sure, that all of us understood that in God's divine plan and in God's divine wisdom, he sent Jesus to earth in the form of a man to uh, preach the truth and also eventually to die for the sins of man. With that, Jesus created a new covenant, a new beginning for each one of us in which all of us can gain salvation through his death, through his burial, and through his resurrection. So let's now Commune with the Lord the way he has appointed us to do so. Let's pray for the bread. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful in your divine wisdom that you set this great plan in order that Jesus would leave the heavenly abode and come down to earth in the form of a man. That, would he, that he would teach wonderful truths and then he would die as a perfect sacrifice for each one of us. As we partake of the bread, help us to remember the agony that he went through on the cross for each one of us. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. <clears throat> we now recognize the blood that flowed from Jesus' body, from his head, from his hands, and from his feet, and from his side. We know that life-giving blood uh, to us represents exactly that. As his blood left his body, that blood is a remembrance for each one of us. It's a remembrance that God's grace is poured over us and that we can have forgiveness of sins and the opportunity to live with you forever. 
Help us to appreciate the blood that Jesus shed. We pray it in his most holy name. Amen. And on the first day of the week, we are also told through the Holy Spirit inspired word to lay by and store that which we have prospered and then give it back to the Lord, knowing indeed that what we have comes from the heavens above. We know that when we give back, we give back to God his own. But we understand the usable part of this uh, uh, this memorial that we do every Lord's Day. And that is so that we can sustain the kingdom of God here on earth, that it can do what it's supposed to do. And through these monies that we can uh, help uh, the kingdom of God grow. Let's pray for the giving. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to give with a cheerful heart. Help us to give that which we have prospered. Help us to uh, understand that uh, the gifts that we give are so that the church can operate the way it's supposed to operate. We pray for those that are in charge of these monies that they will be used to sustain your kingdom here on earth. Bless us in our giving. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. <coughs> And the last song that we will sing is number 704. 704. It's called Bind Us Together. 704. The song is about unity. And uh, that is what I'm going to talk about this evening. Bind Us Together. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with words that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together in love. There is only one God. There is only one King, there is only one body, that is why we can sing. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. That concludes our song service. I know that the Lord was praised in our singing. I hope that we were uplifted through the singing. Uh, we sing praises to the Lord because certainly he is deserving of those praises. I have begun a series of lessons uh, over the past few Sunday evenings, and uh, the title, the general title of the lessons are The Way of Christ. In some of these lessons, we've uh, uh, come to understand that the way of Christ is the way to God. It is the way to life. It's the way to truth. It's the way to love. It's the way to joy. As we saw last week, it is the way to peace. And with that, this Sunday evening, we will hopefully come to understand that the way of Christ is also the way of unity. Christ did much while he was here, here on earth to promote unity and to attain unity. And so Christians have, I believe, the Christ-given duty to maintain unity. And so first, I would like to look at this evening how Christ exactly attains this unity. 
First, Jesus foretold unity. He spoke in John chapter 10, verse 16, as there being one flock, one shepherd. That's unity, one flock under one shepherd. And those not of this fold uh, could be brought in. That's what evangelizing is all about. And with that, the Gentiles were eventually brought in to the church. They were brought in in that same unity. Jesus prayed for that unity. He prayed fervently that his believers would be one. We find that in John chapter 17, verses 20 to 23. Why? He wanted us to be unified so that all that saw us as Christians would know that we are believers in God. And moreover, at that time, those who saw him and listened to him would know he was from God and he and God were one. Unity. We just observe the Lord's Supper and we need to understand that Jesus died for unity. His death on the cross broke down the wall of division. We find that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 to 16. Why did he do that? So all on the earth would have the opportunity to come to God, both Jews and Gentiles. It was no longer an exclusive club. At one time, the Jews were called God's chosen people. Now it's Christians that are his chosen people. We're the ones that are the royal priesthood that Peter talks about. And so with that, Jesus died so that we would all be one in him. You know, the disciples were with Jesus for some three years. And from all accounts that we read in the Bible, there were things that they understood and there are things that they did not understand. And so with that, to make it crystal clear, in John chapter 16, verses 12 and 13, he promised to send them a guide. He promised to send them a guide so that the apostles would have all truth. And so with that, when the apostles taught, they taught unity. Why? Because the Holy Spirit that was conferred upon them taught them that and taught them to teach that, to teach that we are all to be one. And so we sent the Holy Spirit for exactly that reason. And so as we saw from the very, very beginning, when Peter preached that first gospel sermon in the second chapter of the book of Acts, we know that those people that obeyed the, the gospel were added to the church. That's found in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, verse 41, and verse 47. And so what happened was when they were baptized into the Lord, they became one church. And that's explained for us by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 21, 23, and chapter 4, verse 4. And with that, in the first century, he, he gave gifts to them in the first century. 
because there wasn't a written word yet. He gave them the gifts of prophecy and the gifts of speaking in tongues and the gift of interpreting those tongues. And then he gave them more permanent things. He gave certain people functions within the church. We find that that these various people that would be appointed were designed to lead the church in unity. And so in, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16, it says some were apostles and prophets to reveal the truth of God. Some were evangelists, some were pastors, and some were there to teach the truth of God's word. And with that, Jesus calls the unfaithful out of the equation. We find that in that wonderful 15th chapter of uh, John, where it talks about, I am the vine and you are the branches. Only the branches that abide in the vine and bear fruit, those are the ones that are and will remain in his presence. And it's pretty clear that those that aren't will be burned up. Uh, the writer of Revelation, John, also revealed that in Revelation chapter 5. And so with that, as we look at Jesus Christ himself, we come to understand that he was all about promoting unity. And uh, he wanted to do that and create not only unity, but to ensure that unity. But now we come to the second part of the lesson, and that is, what do we have to do with that? And so the second part of the lesson is in the form of a question. How do Christians maintain unity? Well, we, we do it by following the Holy Spirit-inspired word of God. The disciples, that's us, should take Jesus's prayer of unity in John chapter 17 and verse 20 to 23 very, very seriously. The apostle Paul certainly did. He taught, told us that we were one body in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 10 through 13. Thus, as Christians, we should discard anything that has any semblance of disunity. We shouldn't have any creeds. We didn't, shouldn't have any traditions of men. No earthly organizations. The only earthly organization is the church of the living God. And it is to be one. And it is to be unified. Now, before the written word in uh, the first century, after the first people in the second chapter of Acts came to God, those 3,000 who were baptized in response to Peter's sermon, what characterized the early church in verse 42 of Acts chapter 2 was they followed the apostles' teachings. Thus, we too should be unified and content in abiding in the apostles' teachings. No latter-day revelations, no uh, self-ordained uh, prophets, no new enlightenments. All the enlightenment we need is found in the Holy Spirit-inspired Word. That's where we find out about our unity. And then there's another important unity, and that is the unity of the Spirit. Ephesians chapter uh, 4, verses 3 through 6, explains that oneness. There's one body one spirit, one hope, 
one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. Do we notice one? That's unity. We are all to be one. And we are to do that uh, right there in, in the bond of peace. Thus, as Christians, we should forever strive for unity, but we should strive for it in a peaceful manner, never compromising the, the, uh, the words of the Spirit and the truth of the Spirit and not compromising the Spirit of Jesus Christ. How do we do that? Well, the scriptures explain it to us. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, uh, the gist of this is that we are to have the mind of Christ. And you might say, well, how do we develop the mind of Christ? That's what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all about. Those are the gospels of Jesus Christ. Through those gospels, we come to understand what the mind of Christ actually means. Now, having the mind of Christ means that we have to be as humble as he was. Uh, again, in the letter to the Philippians, uh, Paul explains that in the second chapter of Philippians, verses 5 through 8. And so we should work hard in our lives as a church for this unity, remembering Jesus because he died, first of all, that we might have that unity in him. And then to have the mind of Christ who did so with humility. He died on the cross with humility. He died because he loved the loss. And so I hope that this lesson engendered for us the importance of being one in Jesus Christ. I hope that it engendered in us to understand how Jesus in his teachings promoted unity as he prayed for unity, as he died for unity, as he sent the Holy Spirit as he adds the save to his one body, as he gave gifts to the church, and how he calls to the unfaithful. And then in the second part of this lesson, what Christians have to do to maintain this unity by heeding the prayers of Jesus Christ that we would all be one and that there should be no divisions among us. When they see us, they ought to see that we are in Christ. Just as Jesus said, when you see me, you see the Father. When people see us as Christians, the love that we show tells them that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. By abiding in the Holy Spirit inspired word, in the apostles' doctrine, just as they did in the first century. And finally, by developing the mind of Christ that is explained in the four Gospels. As we complete this lesson, I hope that we understand that the way of Christ is the way of unity. Why? Because it's important to Jesus. He died for it. He died to make this possible. His apostles, through their teachings, charged all of the believers to be one. And those who respect Jesus' efforts will follow the way of unity. Number one, by abiding in his word. Number two, by developing his attitude. Three, by preserving the truth and being and holding fast to the apostles' teachings. I'd like to finish with the 133rd Psalm and verse 1. And it says, Behold 
how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Not only is it a wonderful principle, it's a glorious thought that when we attend worship service with our brothers and sisters, that we are united in the Lord. We all have the same goals and we're all there to help and encourage one another because we're unified in love. We're unified in humility. We're unified in the teachings of the Holy Spirit inspired word. If you're not a child of God this evening, we offer that invitation to you to be one. Just as everything that we've talked about comes from the Holy Spirit inspired word, how we get into Christ is right there in bold print. We need to hear and believe the word of God and that we have to make that wonderful confession that Jesus Christ is the son of God. To say to our God, I don't want to be the way I used to be. I want to repent of those things that I've done and try my very, very best not to do them again. And finally, to be baptized for the remission of our sins. If you haven't done that yet, we are at your beck and call. If you need to come to the Lord, be in touch with one of us and we will be there to help you. Let's close in prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, as we've looked at uh, the theme of the lesson this evening, help us all to strive to be one in you. Help us to be without division. Help us indeed, uh, as you explained uh, to us, uh, help us to work for that unity uh, that we need to have. Help us to understand uh, that, that there is indeed one hope and one Lord. And in that, that we are to be unified in you. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father, as we walk uh, down your paths. Help us to want to walk together with our fellow Christians, knowing that we all are walking toward that same goal. Be with us and continue to bless us. Help us to lift Jesus Christ to the world as the Savior of mankind. We pray that you would be with us always. And we pray it in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all.